human beings behave in many ways. Sometimes it's a peculiarity of the individual. Sometimes there are great similarities because of the pastime being followed. At work, individual behavior patterns have to be modified to ensure that the work is done correctly. Although in most occupations, individuality can be allowed. When working in clean rooms, it's necessary to follow very precise procedures, even to the extent of controlling individual trays. Human beings are one of the main contaminators in clean rooms. This is due to the physiological attributes of the body, and the movement which disperses particles from the body into the environment. There are two means by which people generally cause contamination. The first is by dispersion, where particulate matter, which is itself damaging, but equally is the carrier of viable organisms such as bacteria, is allowed free into the air. The other method is by cross-contamination, where matter is transferred by touch from one material surface to another. This means, of course, by the human hand. This program is a visual dictionary of the well-researched and proven rules of correct and incorrect behavior in clean rooms. People contaminate in all clean rooms operating today, and even in the foreseeable future, with a much greater degree of isolation technology and automation, this will still be true. So let's look at how people contaminate. We filmed various activities, some acceptable and some totally unacceptable in clean rooms and we measured the particles that these activities generated. This was done by using a laser particle counter and measuring the dispersed particles. With clean room clothing correctly worn, the particle count was very low. This person, who's standing still, isn't contributing greatly to the room's contamination. When he moves, he disperses far more particles. The count when looking at a watch demonstrates why watches and jewelry are forbidden. With the coverall unzipped, the count increases. How about this? Breaking a biscuit, as well as all the rules, for those who sneak food into a clean room. Reading a newspaper, totally forbidden in the clean room, but probably equivalent to taking paper into the clean room and reading notes, proves why this is a bad practice. Coughing without a face mask and after smoking gives a very high count. And worse, measuring the particles given off by the wrong type of wiping materials shows how much care should be taken not only with the use of these materials but with the selection and purchase of the correct cleaning equipment. By that we mean cleaning materials which are compatible with clean room use. It's the human micro-environment which causes skin flakes shed by the body to be dispersed by the effect of heat and pressure radiating them into the atmosphere. In a clean room, the body increases the divergence of downward vertical laminar airflow and may be considered to form a symmetrical bell shape, which is intended to control the effects of the inverted bell-shaped air current created by the human micro-environment. Whilst a person is stationary, the two forces are dominated by the downward airflow of the clean room and particles dispersed are carried away by the rapid air changes. A person standing still with arms at the side will give a different dispersion characteristic to someone with arms outstretched. These two configurations, plus the speed of movement, give the clues as to how people should behave in the clean room. Let's look at speed of movement. To make this film, we used smoke generators emitting white smoke through both a single source outlet and a manifold, creating multiple downward flows to give clearly defined visualization of the dispersion mechanism. All filming was done in a vertical laminar flow clean room with perforated floor, and special lighting was arranged to highlight the visualizations. By the way, you'll notice that when something is being done correctly in our programs, a green tick appears on the screen. When something is done wrong, a red cross can be seen. 
First, let's look at correct movement. The subject moves slowly but purposefully. Even so, we can see that turbulence is caused by his motion through the vertical laminar airstreams. Turbulent vortices, which he creates, are passed quickly through the floor by the airflow and probably cause little damage. Now the incorrect way of moving. The subject is moving far too quickly. His pace could be described as hectic. But look at the turbulence he creates behind him. Here the turbulence is so great that any particles dispersed from his body or the items which he is carrying will be taken up and outwards by the horizontal vortices formed, thus causing great risk of contamination to anything behind or on either side of him. Let's look again at the correct way of moving. Look at what happens with the arms. The way we move and hold materials have an important impact in the clean room. What happens is that vertical airflow is diverted by anything in its way, and human arms redirect the airflow from the shoulders, down the arms, and onto the sensitive products being produced or manipulated. The importance of correct body positioning is highlighted by this sequence, which, with control of movement, can make the difference between product yield and rejects. For example, bending the elbows like this, rather than movements like this, will eliminate the problem. The relationship between the body, the speed of movement and the work area are all critical. For example, it's wrong to move rapidly to a work area and to stop suddenly and to turn to sit down. This will create a vortex of particle carrying air which will contaminate. It's correct to move slowly to the workstation, then to sit without hands touching the chair and to position oneself carefully. Taking this to the next stage, it's wrong to approach a person working at a clean bench and to talk to them across the workpiece. Obviously it's wrong whether you move quickly or slowly. The correct method is to approach from behind so that neither person faces the workplace whilst talking. We can see that leaning over the work area will cause particles to be deposited on any equipment, the work surface and onto the product. Let's just look again at the correct way to sit at a clean room workbench. The erect posture and careful position of the arms and hands are clearly demonstrated. Of great importance too is the way one behaves at this point. It's completely wrong to rest the hands and elbows on the bench and to scratch one's face or to touch any other part of the body. Working in a clean room is a very responsible job. It's correct that the hands have contact only with the products being manipulated or with their tooling or materials or the instrumentation needed for the job. Let's review the things not to do. No eating, no smoking, no reading of papers, no talking across the workbench, no rapid movements. Here are two illustrations of the care and thought needed to behave properly all the time, even when doing something which is totally repetitive. Firstly, a simple transfer of liquid from one tube to another. This applies in the pharmaceutical field, but could equally apply in any clean room. The operative has carefully removed the stopper, sterilized the rim, transferred the solution, then he forgets and rubs himself. That was wrong. Now he does it correctly. Another example. A wafer carrier in a wafer fab. The operative holds the carrier incorrectly, at the top, so that particles can flow off his or her body, and worse still, he slides the carrier towards him, which both generates particles and disperses any others which may exist. This is the correct way. Method and movement can be illustrated in something as simple as opening and closing a hinged box. Here, the speed of action speaks for itself. It's obviously wrong. To do it correctly is not difficult. There's a right and wrong way to carry materials in a clean room. Apart from the pace, it's also a question of how to hold what you're carrying. Here we can see it done correctly with the hands at the bottom of the carrier and the carrier held high. 
Holding it in the wrong way and too low will cause bad contamination. All of us need to cough, and if you're in the clean room and need to cough or sneeze, you must look away from the workplace. Of course, you shouldn't be at work if you have a cold or influenza or any other illness. Coughing and sneezing can cause an alarming increase in contamination because not only are particles being generated, but they're mixed with liquid droplets in aerosol as well. Masks other than full containment helmets will only divert your emissions. They will not stop them. Correct behavior in the clean room must be practiced by everyone who enters or works there. Clean rooms contain machinery, instrumentation and tooling and these need maintenance and repair. The behavior of maintenance staff is as critical as for production staff, particularly if adjustments are being made. As an example, our smoke generator started misbehaving and this sequence demonstrates that if a hand tool is dropped, it should be placed in the container for removal, not reused. The finished job should be cleaned to clean room standards. Here, localized cleaning is being done by the operative. He's doing it completely wrong. Notice the scrubbing action. We may have exaggerated a little, but there's a big difference between that and here, where it's being done correctly. The correct way of putting on and wearing clean room clothing is absolutely critical. People who work in clean rooms shouldn't look like this. You may laugh, but there are parts of that disaster on legs which can be seen only too often. This is what you should look like. To summarize, when working in a clean room, behavior and movement are critical. Remember, dress correctly, move correctly, act correctly, and work correctly. It may be that the product you're making is something where failure will be merely annoying. It may be that you're working on something where failure will be much more important. Please behave correctly in the clean room. <laughs>